Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, Mary Olson to come and talk to us now about gender matters in the atomic age. I'll just do a very brief introduction to, to Mary. Um, she's working at the Nuclear Information and Resource Service uh, and gender on, uh, sorry, on the Gender and Radiation Impact Project. Um, if it's okay with you, Mary, I'll stop at that point. Yeah, and 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 I, first I want to say how honored I am to be here and to be with this group of people. And it's been an incredible kaleidoscope of a week for me. And the last few days were precious, and I started in London at an event I'm going to tell you about, but um, wow, just wow. Um, so in, in where I come from, we're very big on honoring time, and we're starting my talk 15 minutes on my clock, maybe it's only 10, uh, later than I was supposed to. Do we need to end crisply at 5? Because it's going to change how I go. Okay, all right. Do uh, feel bad? Okay. So, uh, it's a pun, gender matters in the atomic age. And Mariana was just talking about you have to have the right measuring device to go out and measure what you're trying to talk about. We've heard about different lenses and looking at the thing depending on the point of view. So, I first need to apologize. I am really talking about biological sex. But in the United States, in the rooms that I go into at the policy level, if I start off by talking with the word sex, ah, I've lost them instantly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, that's what I'm going to be talking about. But Monday, I was at an European Union gender summit because of the number of nations that are mandating uh, forward motion on gender equality in society, um, gender equity, gender, all kinds of different words. They're, creating a whole new language, they're working on word definitions like we've heard about this week here, um, but they are very big on evidence-based, and they've been very interested in the analysis of uh, biological sex and radiation, so the paper I presented there is very similar to what I'm doing here, and uh, I want to point out this little set of words. If you Google it, it's going to take you to a peer-reviewed paper a global call for action to include gender in research impact. And I think everybody in this room who does any type of research needs to ask the same question Mariana did. And it, whether it's part of your research question or not, when you're doing the research impact, ask that question. Is, is biological sex potentially a factor? Okay, run to the end of the story. Uh, I'm going to be telling you the story of how I came to write this paper. Atomic radiation is more harmful to women. And I really recommend a blunt title because this title brought me into most of this story. My sister is an artist. She lets me use her images. I want to remind us that this is all, all of life interacts with the radioactivity in our environment. But I am focusing on human. So uh, fact is the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission uses reference man for all its regulations. There's been some change in various other bodies, we can talk about that. But um, I'm going to be unfolding for you how invisible she is in this picture. The ICRP published a definition of reference man, and it's not used by all agencies anymore, but the nuclear energy regulator in the United States uses this. So there's a little scenario, and the scenario is defined here of a man who is 20 to 30 years old. He weighs a certain amount. He has a certain height. He lives in a certain climate. He is defined as Caucasian. He has a lifestyle that's Western European or North American, meaning industrial. Our Native American communities are always running up against this. <laughs> Acknowledging that the US Environmental Protection Agency uses somewhat different calculations, uh, primarily incorporating age. The, oops. The one point I want to make here is my dear friend David Lockdown works at UCS, Union of Concerned Scientists, and he's compiled over 900 documents from the document retrieval system online for the regulator that site or state reference man is used. So there's absolutely no question about this. Uh, when you go to look online for the human life cycle, you see something like this. We do have a problem, though because these envelope that's being used is being used for calculating exposure. It is the basis for some units of exposure. It is used to assess the harm or relative harm 
of both radionuclides and any event that uh, may occur, release of radioactivity to the environment. Um, and the effective dose equivalent models are uh, also heavily influenced by these assumptions. I know this, uh, we're using Sieverts, the REM is pretty much gone, but remember the history, low antigen equivalent man. So we could be focusing on age, but I'm about to tell you that's not good enough. And I'm gonna tell you in a bunch of different ways how that's not good enough. And this came to me in about 2009 in a situation very similar to this right now. A woman raised her hand after my talk and she posed this question, is radiation more harmful to me than it is to a man? I gave her a perfectly good answer about pregnancy. She raised her hand again. She said, I wasn't asking about pregnancy, I was asking about my body. I was flummoxed, absolutely flummoxed. This was 2009, I missed two memos. One is the Beer 7 report itself, and the other is Dr. Arjumakajani's analysis of Beer 7, published under the title Science for the Vulnerable, and the whole campaign called Healthy from the Start. <laughs> My two, the two organizations, IER, the one I work for, totally wedded with each other over the years, working on many things. He never sent it to me. I never saw the particular newsletter. Didn't happen. I have all these wonderful honored teachers, and Tim, you're on that list. I don't mean I've sat in their classrooms. I mean I've read their works. I've asked them questions. I have interacted with them, including happily Alice in her lifetime. Um, we'll hear more about Rosalie. Steve was a good friend. You know, lots of good people, but not a single one of them ever mentioned to me biological sex in terms of radiation harm. So here I am, and it's now 2011. I have kind of forgotten the question because I was so embarrassed to not have an answer. And reactors are blowing up. And my boss is telling me I need to reach out to Japan to talk about radiation. And I'm going, yeah, I do need to reach out to Japan, but I have this problem. And so I finally called Rosalie, who's actually in the last months of her life. She'd become a mentor of mine. I was traveling up to visit her uh, three, four times a year in her last years. She really wanted me to be a student, but I couldn't afford that. So I called her. She was barely able to talk. I said, Rosalie, you have this problem. You know, where do I find the answer? And she said, well, you have to go to the data, I guess. And I said, oh, Rosalie, not me. I'm, I'm an accidental analyst in this picture. I don't, I don't do that. I'm an educator. I work on policy. I do all these other things. She said, well, get some paper, get some pencils, get some erasers. And I said, Rosalie, I really can't do this. And she said, well, Mary, if it's there, it's in the data. I said, where is that? She said, in Beer 7. I said, really? There's data in Beer 7, not just conclusions? She said, yes, it's in there. And then she said, it'll be a simple pattern. You can find it. And I said, no. She said, yes, because you have no training, you won't make it complicated. <laughs> now, the next problem, there's two more problems for me about having to do this analysis. The first is that Beer 7 was something that the organization I work for worked very hard to try and get a more diverse panel of people to do that work. And we felt we failed. And so it was kind of a heresy to even open the book. And then the second problem is that it suddenly dawned on me that these were the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that I was going to be looking at. It was primarily the lifespan study. And I always have to now acknowledge that it was my country who decided to use the first nuclear weapons on cities full of people. And the horrific nature of the numbers I was looking at really caused me great, great, great difficulty to proceed. But worker studies don't have children in them. The in-works data set is beginning to have enough women to talk about gender and the adults, but really the survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as horrible and awful as that whole situation, I as one woman wish it had never happened, regardless of any historical context. I wish we could just wish it away. But it's the only place where you can begin to ask and answer these questions. So I have a little slide I'm going to skip over really all the problems with Beer 7. I would love for you to send me all of your critiques because I agree there's every kind of problem with it. There's the moral, there's the makeup, I said, there's the survivors who survived. The study started five years after the bombs. And so they were very, very strong people, not representative. Lots of critiques of the handling of the data. Um, I'm not gonna even try to go into the last one without this time. But suffice it to say, I went ahead and I looked at the numbers. And first you have to understand that the first deaths did occur. This is the <laughs> memorial mound in Hiroshima. That's my own photograph of it. Um, and 
and honor that those people are not in this group. Amazingly, because of shelters, there were about 100,000 people who did survive and who are in the lifespan study. We know that radiation is more harmful to children. There's probably lots of reasons we haven't figured out, but we know they're growing and their cells are dividing more quickly, and that alone is a basis for more harm. The big shock in the numbers when you resolve the year seven tables into simple so many, one in so many, that's all I did, one in so many, you, you begin to see simple ratios pop out. And the most shocking of which is that when the age cohorts, the age the people were in 1945 at the time of the bomb, they were grouped birth to five, five to 10, blah, 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 all the way across to age 80, and then tracked. And by the time year seven was published, there were 60 years of data. Um, so it's not a surprise that you have more cancer in the youngest children. But what is a surprise is this ratio. For every one boy who eventually died of cancer, not childhood cancers, two girls died of cancer. This is a doubling, and any biological moment we can call in, we say, wow, doubling, that's kind of big. Not as big as 10 times, which we're going to get to. Now, this picture I want to take a moment to explain, because it is not a dose-response curve. It is not a distribution analysis. It really probably should be reported as a uh, bar chart. But this is the ages I mentioned, the age cohorts from 1945, when those bombs fell on those two cities, the age that people were when that event occurred. This is 60 years of data. These are not projections. These are not risk analyses. These are actual reports of actual data, um, cancer occurrences. And so in a very real way, it's, they fix it at any different dose level, and the dose is presumed to be constant. So this is fixed at um, 20 millisieverts. In a very real way, this is a snapshot of <laughs> this population's response to an external dose of gamma and neutron radiation. And that is the study question in this case. Everything else that happened after is presumed to be not what is being studied. So this picture, I'm going to show you several more times with a couple more um, communication elements, but it's the same it's the same graph. And I think what's most notable to me, in addition to the fact that the difference is greatest in young children, this is about doubled, is the fact that there's a difference all the way across. OK, going quickly, we are not a subpopulation. We are part of the human life cycle. Again, the cancers are not necessarily childhood cancers that appear. They're across the entire lifetime. I'm showing you the graph again. I don't remember the note, so we'll just keep going. Oh, yeah. To, to focus in on right about this point, there's a adult analysis, which shows now with fatalities, for every two men who died, three women died. This changed my behavior in the field. I was in Fukushima with Arnie Gunderson, and I said, Arnie, we're close to the same age. You want to go out? Fine. I'm so happy you want to go out. I'm going to stay in because they, even at our age, uh, increased hazard to me. So this slide shows the only part that the decision maker sees. This is the data underpinning reference man. And I, this isn't as dark as I sometimes make it. But the rest of the information is currently invisible, except for possibly a few people over in ICRP, but in general, Decision makers, policy people, have never heard that there is a differentiation between males and females in the response to exposure. And quite frankly, when you take this reference man quite seriously, which the NRC does, and you completely exclude the highest point on your plot, and that highest point is times 10, you start having a little bit of a situation here. And I need to just underscore that these are lifetime figures. This is 60 years of data in each little bucket. It's not, you know, the guys over at EPA act like, oh, this is the few years in your childhood and this is the few years in your adulthood. No, this is the response of the people who were these ages when they were exposed over 60 years. So these are lifetime figures. Reference man does not do a particularly good job for males either. This is where the 
uh, youngest boys measure up, and it's about five times what the reference man. I'm rounding up, but you know what? We've been rounded out, so I don't care. Um, 2,000 nuclear detonations. This is not the fallout map. This is a proportional picture of where the detonations occurred. This is one portrayal of iodine impact through milk as the pathway, so therefore children are definitely in this picture of absorbed dose from iodine. And this, of course, is the French agency's reproduction of the measured cesium deposition from Chernobyl. One half-life, yay! 29 to go, right? So a lot of people I talk to think that children don't get radiation exposure. You all know different, so I'm gonna go quickly here. Background, residues of fallout, radon in the home, uh, our efficient homes are increasing that. Air travel, as we have divided families and children are going back and forth. Um, medical and dental diagnosis and treatment, and I will mention that in interventional radiation, a lot of non-disclosure that if you're having surgery, you're also having a sidecar of ionizing radiation. Not all, but often now. Um, and then, of course, all the nuclear facilities which are licensed to permit uh, discharges. And we're going to jump to that. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that at the time Reference Man was created, that scenario, that definition, it was pretty accurate of most of the people who were being exposed to nat radiation over and above naturally occurring levels. This was the military and paramilitary. This was the early radiation medical community. Um, it, was, it was pretty accurate. But nobody stopped to ask whether it represents the general population. Now, here's some research questions. Because ultimately, I truly believe, and I have a whole slide saying this, but I'm going to say it right now, that the cure for this situ situation is good basic science from multidiscipline uh, dimensions and lots of questions, not just the ones I'm going to pose here. But if we can break it out of what has essentially been a trade group um, supporting industries that have to expose people in order to operate, uh, I think we'll get a better picture. And once we have that better picture, maybe we can then go back around to the policies. Um, but, you know, I'd love to fund Tim to be able to ask this question as he goes and looks at cohorts in contaminated places. Um, what about internal exposure? All the lifespan is that one big blast of external radiation. Is there a gender factor in internal? And then the big question, why? Why would there be a difference, especially since it's the youngest children? And so under why we get people are saying, well, it's a percentage of hot tissue. That's what Rosalie said. Other people are saying fatty tissue. These are all just subjective off the top of your head. Nobody's asking it in an honest to goodness, testable hypothesis funded research program. Um, rate of cell division has been brought and other maturation factors because uh, females get to puberty sooner, maybe that could be part of it, but your question here. Uh, Richardson has already looked at the InWorks uh, data set for the question of many small versus one big. We've heard lots of other thoughts about that here, and so I'm not necessarily taking this as the uh, only answer, but he certainly has a very strong, with his large group of people on that research uh, supposition. I think you guys know most of this. I want to jump here to the fact that 2011, gee, that was a while ago, Mary, you're still telling the same story. Well, I got pulled into work at the diplomatic level, and I am so incredibly pleased and proud to have been part of what really is a global campaign. And I can only say I had a tiny piece in it. But we now have a new treaty called the Convention on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It was uh, about a year ago that the language was finalized, and now 59 nations have signed it to date. It's part of our United Nations, and it's taking nuclear weapons under humanitarian law, which is why they pulled me in. They were very interested in biological sex and radiation health consequences for children and women because it helped to illustrate the point that the humanitarian and moral side has been under discussed as we treat nuclear as only a military aspect of our lives. 
And so this new um, treaty in the preamble has these words. I'm going to read them. And the health of current and future generations. This is about nuclear weapons. And have a disproportionate impact on women and girls, including as a result of ionizing radiation, is in the preamble on the first page. So I'm very concerned that we not leave this in those big clouds of energy and weapons because the day in and day out fact is a little girl shouldn't have to defend herself, you know? And so that's the origin of founding this new project. I'm not gonna go into it, but over dinner you can ask me, but it's devoted to supporting more good research questions. And that's the CURE uh, data sets now. I still have like five minutes, so I want to go into more than this occupational stuff that was for the EU meeting, but the fact is radiation therapists in the United States, mostly female, flight attendants where they're getting much more exposure, again in the United States, mostly female, but this is the one I want to, to really spend the last couple minutes on. When I was a little girl at the dinner table, there was a discussion of socially regulated industrial activity like nuclear energy, for instance. How much harm should it be allowed to ha you know, make in the general population? And there was this concept that was being floated around that if one in a million people died, well, that would be kind of OK. And um, so I decided to go from the general report of 100,000, which, by the way, is because of the lifespan study, to the million level and look at what it looks like when you just do the simple math that Rosalie reminded me I really could do. So I'm taking the one millisievert, which, yeah, we get different numbers for what is natural background, what is the limit here, the limit there, but it's in the ballpark of what's considered to be an acceptable level. So the question is, is it one in a million? I have this disclaimer, I don't need to read it. Basically, I'm not endorsing the risk levels I'm about to report to you. I am using them because they are the official ones in the United States. I don't agree with them. I am not telling you they are correct. I'm simply extrapolating from their risk numbers. And by the way, all they do is take a one-year risk and multiply by 70 for their reference man to have a lifetime. And so I engage in some of the same stuff, and I'll show you. So 70 years, one millisievert. You can also talk about 70 millisieverts, the way this stuff is done. So that's what it says up at the top. When you look into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's own evaluations, they will tell you there'll be 3,500 fatal cancers per million. They don't say reference men at that point. They say per million like it's the general population. But you have to make them honest. It's a million reference men. So this is, again, a single year times 70. And that resolves down to one in 286 people, not one in a million. It's not too bad for the overall cancer rate, but still. So now, again, looking at the graph, I'm using this now as a tool, as a measuring device, because it is um, lifelong numbers. And you can take that point and that idea that two men, three women, and you get one in 286 for the men still, and one in 190 for the women. But this is my reminder that it is 60 years of data. So if you're childhood exposed, the males it's one in 57, and for the girls it's one in 29. Well, how do you do that with a 70 year lifetime? Well, that's when you take the 70 millisieverts instead of the times 70. Which, one in 57, one in 29 for a single, one millisievert a year, how many licensees do you live near, how much more stuff do you add on top of it? It's certainly not one in a million. And then taking, just getting a half the annual limit for a worker for 10 years, you get down into numbers like this. And these are fatal cancers according to the US regulator, per 100,000 in this case. But the ratios are constant. So this is the line that has gotten published over and over again now. Radiation regulation based on reference man results in systematic underreporting of radiation harm for the global population. I'm not going to argue with you how much underreporting, because that's the work I want you to do. I'm not a researcher. I'm an accidental analyst. 
but I, I feel as a biologist, as an evolutionary biologist in my original training, that this really can't be ignored. And I'm so pleased it's not being ignored by some, but more people need to look at it because this is how we think of our life cycle. If you take my work and other people's work seriously on gender effects, we really have to see that there's two loops that happen at the point of conception with whether you're biological male or female, not talking about identity, just biology. And I rather like what that tells us. So let's embrace it. And uh, I really feel that all of this information, having been about Earth, I need to point out that this space stuff <laughs> brings all this up, and I intend to go there uh, in terms of uh, the discussion. You Thank you. <laughs> not me. Not, not Star Girl. No, 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 no. Okay. Thank you, Mary. So, any questions for Mary? Yeah, I just want to point out something interesting that you revealed, and that is you've actually got a measure, um, as it were, a surrogate measure for radiation in any geographical area. Because what you can do is you can look, you can map legally, you don't have to go through the Data Protection Act, you can legally map everyone who's died of cancer in a particular area, right? It's by age group. So it follows that if the first question you can ask is, what is your ratio of um, female deaths from cancer at a certain age cohort, mm -hmm. right? No, really not, because there's so many different causes of cancer. Cancer is a very blunt tool for talking yeah, about this. Yeah, but when we talk about people under the age of 15, yeah, I accept what you're saying about occupational problems and you know people dying from smoke things like smoking. But when you look at the population under 15 and you divide it into three cohorts, age cohorts, you are then beginning to look at a specific question, which is what's happening with the ratio. I'm gonna interrupt you because the cancers come across the entire lifetime, which is why it's such a stunning underreporting. If it was childhood cancer we could do what you're talking about. But it's not. The cancers that are the result of the exposure of a three-year-old girl or a three-year-old boy or whatever age express across the lifetime. And so it, it's a lot more work, and we need to do it. It's, that's my big point, is this is not a simple question, but it's also a question that is easily available in any study of radiation, and people simply aren't looking. So yes, we need to look, but this kind of large data analysis I have quarreled with, even with my father's best friend, a man named Ernest Sturlass, who I used to have to say, Ernie, please don't say correlation is causation, because it's not always. Sometimes it is, but we can't know, and I want good, good science. I'm, I'm a snob. <laughs> not to say you can't have good statistics as well. I'm not trying to say you're, you're off, but in this case, I don't think you can do what you're saying. Although it would be very interesting, and I, I don't think we've ever looked at it, as to what the gender was of the children who got leukemia in Seneca as opposed to the gender. Oh, gender. goodness, we're out of time, but I'd love tonight, if you're around, or tomorrow, to do the slides from Germany about the opening of reactor vessels, because we now understand why there are cancer clusters and leukemia clusters. Well, I'll just quickly tell you, when you open a reactor vessel, it results in a spike that is a yeah. plume over a yeah, short period of time, and so the people who are downwind mm -hmm. are disproportionately impacted, and all the other people are getting sort of more random impacts. And so the clusters are associated with those plumes of the reactor vessel opening. Yeah, sure. That's the release of the radiation. Yeah, there's a lot of tritium because of the water vapor, and then there's <laughs> the noble gases, and God only knows what else, depending on the condition of the fuel at the time of the opening. It's only like a week long usually, this plume, but um, we, we had a whistleblower who leaked the information along with the leaking radiation, and that's how IPPNW of Germany published the graph of the levels of radi radioactivity across a refueling period. But all the reactors refuel, you can't refuel without opening the vessel, so yeah. And then uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that I've heard of six clusters in the United States and they are all little girls. I can't tell you that's significant, but I can tell you that it certainly makes me stand up 
as many times as I can and talk about this. Well, that's where the statistics comes in. If you get a, if you get a whole lot of, I mean, there's another interesting point actually. It's said uh, that the uh, offspring of uh, jet fighters, pilots, are nearly always girls. We'll have to talk to Mariana about that. Put gender in your studies, girl. <laughs> Thank you so much.